topic of the <coughs> duties of directors, but before getting into the precise, what I want to do is to tell you how the modern company Everyone see okay? Okay. So in England, in the period 1760 to 1830, very interesting development occurred. You've all heard of it, the Industrial Revolution. And in the Industrial Revolution, a lot of new inventions, uh, the modern mass production factories, and that brought a challenge because until then, the way people conducted their business was either as a sole trader or as a partnership. And for small ventures, that was appropriate. So in a partnership, you might have 10 people, investing in the enterprise. They all participate in management. And when one of them leaves, that's the end of the partnership, it's not a separate entity. So what happened in the Industrial Revolution, the big units of production needed vast tools of finance and many people had to contribute. So a new form of business had to be established and that was the modern company. And the modern company had three features. First, juridical personality. It was a separate entity. If the members, the shareholders, new ones came, other ones departed, the company still carried on. It owned its assets, was subject to liabilities, could enter into contracts, could sue and be sued. Then, so that's juristic personality, separate entity. Then you had limited liability. If any person invested in the company and it failed, their liability was limited to what they invested. And then you had the most important feature relevant to today. Because there were so many owners, the shareholders, they couldn't all participate in management. So who managed the company? The directors. And this is known as the famous separation between ownership and control. And that's at the heart of company law. So, the controllers directors the owners the shareholders and most of company law is balancing between those two primary organs of a company. Because those are the owners, quote unquote, and these are the controllers, the directors, the law imposes on them duties, and we're going to get into it. And when you hear about corporate governance, corporate governance is not separate 
from corporate law. It's corporate law. It's how these people are accountable there. So that's really the heart of company law. And when you have a start, when you have an African bank, a Tonga, the courts become more strict on enforcing their duties there. There's new laws that come, changes to the Companies Act. And when you then have a growing economy, a new boom, then people become more relaxed about them. But if you look at the case law, I'm going to take you through it. Over the century, it's all about crafting, formulating the duties of directors. Now, as life became more complex, economies grew. There were new stakeholders, senior management. So the directors started delegating. Uh, they couldn't. You have an IBM, General Motors. The board can't do everything. So the board started delegating to senior managers and we call those prescribed officers and we'll deal with them. They started delegating more widely to employees. Then there is customers, suppliers, the local community, the state. And all of these are called stakeholders. And now company laws become very advanced. To whom do directors owe their duties? Primarily to the shareholders. But in discharging those duties to the shareholders, they are entitled and obliged to take into account the interests of all stakeholders. So I'll give you an example. We all talk about sustainable companies. If directors disregard the environment, the company is not sustainable. If they disregard employees, they won't attract and retain good talent. So, the, uh, the primary duty are owed by the directors to the shell. But in doing so, they must take cognizance of the interests of all stakeholders and one day, if the principal agrees, I'll do you, there is a new development in company law today. And that is the purpose of the company. What is the purpose of a company in modern society? There was a very famous economist in the Chicago School of Business who, uh, Professor Milton Friedman, who said the business of business is business. Maximize profit. That's no longer 
the conventional wisdom. Today, companies are expected to have a proper purpose, to do good in society. And there's a lot of studies in Harvard Law School and Business School that are now talking about, they give example, in India, some of the most profitable companies are those that are making and distributing drugs, affordable drugs to the large population. They're making profits and they're doing good in society. So that's known now as the purpose of the new approach to a good purpose of company and society. So, <clears throat> most of company law is the duties there to them. And there are two categories of duties. One are fiduciary duties, and then there are duties of care, skill, and diligence. Now, people often confuse this, and they lump them together. They say, are the directors discharging their fiduciary duty? But there are two categories, fiduciary duties and duties of care, skill, and diligence. And I'm going to illustrate and draw attention to the difference. So, what are the fiduciary duties? The fiduciary duties are basically integrity. So, there, and before getting into detail, the Companies Act has now been the new Companies Act. Number 71 of 2008, as amended, has what we call codified the director's duties, set them out in section 76, Redwood 77 of the Act. But in fact, and that's happened all over the world, England, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Ghana, Singapore have all codified. And why have they done so? Because they say being a director is not a profession. It's not like a lawyer, architect. They know what their duties are. So it was designed to have a fairly simple statement of the fiduciary duties and the duties of care, skill and diligence. But in fact, it's just a summary of the common law that's been developed through cases over centuries. So let's take the first fiduciary duty. I always tell my students to illustrate the duties of directors. I give them the following example. Little Johnny Green is 10 years old. His father, Chris Green, is in law, he's guardian. And one day his father comes to him and says, Johnny, I have good news and bad news for you. Your uncle died 
and he's left you a hundred million rand. Now, as your guardian, I'm advising you, you must lend that hundred million to me for ten years, interest-free, no security. Now, little Johnny Green has got as much ability to make that decision as the company has when the directors deal with it. The directors represent the company. They decide for it. So the whole of company law is designed to stop the Johnny Green story. The directors um, have an inherent conflict. So, one, they must act honestly. And that is a subject of duty. In the best interests of the company. Now, I'm going to give you a practical example. Many years ago, I was acting for an insurance company which took over, there was a company listed on the stock exchange. And my insurance client took control, bought the shares in that company. I went with the CEO of my client to interview the management. My client said, I'm your new controlling shareholder. I'm the uh, CEO of the controlling shareholder. The eight of you are senior management in the target we just bought. I'd like to talk to you, find out. Uh, you, sir, you're the CEO of this company. How long have you been here? 20 years. Do you have a service contract? Yes. When did you enter into it? Eight months ago. How long is it? Five years. Now, why did you do this? Because it was becoming known in the market that they were going to be taken over. And they were worried they'd be retrenched. So they did themselves a quick service contract. And we went round the room. And every one of them had been there 20 years, 18 years. No service contract eight months ago. So representing the company, they did a contract for themselves, a service contract. So my client got very close. He said, go to court, do an urgent application, and they uh, annul those contracts. We said, no, no. Don't pay them at the end of the month. Let them sue you, and you don't pay them. Because when they entered into those contracts on behalf of the company, they weren't intending to act in the best interests of the company. They were acting in their own interest. Breach fiduciary duty number two. Number three. Avoid conflicts of interest. So, whenever your interest, your personal interest, and your duties to the company conflict, uh, that would be a breach of uh, your fiduciary duty. Now, that's what is substantive law. I'll deal with section 75 of the Act, which deals with how you disclose your interest, leave the room, but this is part of the substantive law. Now, don't usurp corporate opportunities for yourself. 
I'm going to give you some examples. One of the most famous cases on this that's quoted every week in courts all over the world is a South African case. Ranfantine Estates versus Robinson. And in Ranfantine Estates versus Robinson, Robinson was chairman of a big gold mining company. Vast and successfully owning, uh, mining gold. Land next door, Ranfantine Estates wanted to buy. But the seller wouldn't sell. So Robinson, the chairman of Ranfantine Estates, got an agent to buy it for himself and then he sold it to Ranfantine Estates at a profit. Court said forget it. That profit belongs to the company. When you acquired it for yourself, you had a duty to acquire it for the company. The duty not to take corporate opportunity is a subdivision of the duty to avoid conflict. Now, there have been many cases on this, and I'll come to a famous, another famous South African case, but another English case, Cook versus Deeks. And in Cook versus Deeks, there were four shareholders of a company they each owned 25% and they were, four of them were on the board. And they made railway coaches for the Pacific Railways. One day, Pacific Railways decided to approach them to do a new massive contract. Three of the directors shareholders at 75 percent decided to form a new company to take that contract not the company that the four of them were in and they passed a resolution at the board of the company they were in saying they had no interest in taking on this new contract the minority shareholder went to court he said that was a corporate opportunity. It belonged to the company. The directors couldn't take it for themselves and 75% of the shareholders couldn't ratify it. It needed 100%. So what is this doctrine of corporate opportunity? The doctrine of corporate opportunity is that where something is happening in the line of business of the company, the company is entitled to it. Where um, the company has been negotiating for it, and the courts are strict about corporate opportunities, directors not taking for themselves an opportunity that really belongs to the company. So strict are the directors of the court. There was a recent case, major public company, where a director brought a new proposal to the, to the board. Said to the board, colleagues, let's do this. The board said, no, it's a very good proposition but we think there are other opportunities, better allocating capital, we're not going to do this. He said, if you don't want to do it for the company, I think you're mad, colleagues. Can I do it? They said, yes. The shareholders then sued, and he had to give it back. It's even a conflict for directors to allow one of their colleagues to do something which uh, 
started in the country. Now I'm going to give you a case that I always say to my students. If you understand this case, then you understand everything about fiduciary duty. It's called the no profit rule. It's the fifth fiduciary duty. And I'm going to put a quiz to you. Very famous case in England called Regal Hastings versus Gulliver. The facts here. A company called Regal Hastings. Limited. Regal Hastings carried on the business like Sir Kinnacle at hired premises in shopping centres, buildings, and then showed movies there. Very successful business. One day, had a lot of shareholders, directors Gulliver and others one day the board of Regal Hastings saw a new shopping centre and they decided that they should hire more premises in that shopping centre. It was a great opportunity. They went to the landlord, the owner, said, can we hire premises here? He said, no, I want you to form a new company with a capital of £100,000 and that must be the tenant. So they formed a company called Amalgamate. And the directors of Regal Hastings now went to get money. And they could only raise 40,000. 40%. So they said to themselves, it's such a good opportunity for Regal Hastings We'll invest of our own money 60,000. At least Regal Hastings will have 40. It's better than nothing. Some years thereafter, there was a takeover. These shareholders were bought out. And the new shareholders representing the company also bought Gulliver and his colleague shares so they could make amalgamated a wholly owned subsidiary of Regal. And they made a profit in selling those shares. A few years later, Regal Hastings sued the directors for the profit they made. Now, the court found that when the directors put in their own money, they acted honestly, they acted to benefit Regal Hastings, 
Regal Hastings itself couldn't have put up more than 40%. They didn't do it to contemplate a sale. So, as a matter of fact, the court found Regal Hastings couldn't put up more than. The directors were honest. They tried to benefit Regal Hastings. They didn't contemplate making a profit. So, I ask all of you, if you were the judge, on those facts, would you have said they must pay back their profits to Regal Hastings? They acted honestly, in good faith, trying to advance the best interest of their principal, who couldn't do it themselves. If you were the judge, and it went to three tiers of courts, up to the highest court in England, who would have, in the room, who would have made them pay that? What the court said, some of you. If you are a director and you get any benefit from the information, from the use of your position, you're accountable. It doesn't matter whether you're in good faith or bad faith, whether your principal could have done it or not, because there is a potential conflict of interest. If they had known that they couldn't get a benefit for themselves. They might have tried that much harder to raise the money for the company. So, when you're a director, you must never be deflected by any, per any potential of a personal benefit. Because the no profit rule says, only two questions need be asked. Did you get that benefit through the use of information in your capacity as a director and in the course of execution of your office? If yes, nothing else is relevant. In other words, you cannot get a benefit, a personal benefit, from the use of your directorship, your fiduciary position. That is the rule of law, a principle, to ensure that directors aren't deflected from performing their duties because they think there may be a personal... And I always say to my students, if you understand, read this case. Keep it next to your bed. Keep it on your breakfast table. Keep it on your office. If you understand the principle of Regal Hastings versus Gulliver, the strict, the House of Lords says, this is the strict ethic of the law. To me, no, no more important case than this. Next one. Proper purpose. The proper purpose rule. Directors must exercise their powers for the purpose for which they give it. So there was a very famous case in England called Howard Smith versus Ampol Petroleum. And what happened there, a major company in England received a takeover bid. And the bidder were crooks. They had taken over other companies, 
in the past stolen from them. So the board of the target company said, we can't allow this to happen. Um, we must do something to prevent it. So what they did, they bought an asset from a friendly party, issued shares to pay for the asset, and that party was going to vote against the bid. It would fail. Came to court, interdicted that transaction. The court said, the purpose for which directors are given the power to issue shares is to raise capital. It's not to deflect a takeover bid. Yes, you acted honestly. You acted in what you thought were the best interests of the company. But you breached the proper purpose rule. You couldn't do it. So all of these are cumulative. It's not, um, you might comply with these, but you comply, must comply with all of them. The next one, exercise an independent judgment. This is probably relevant to many of you here. You sit on a board as a nominee. What is your duty? One of the most famous cases I've ever been in. One afternoon, I was sitting in my office, 20 past four, Tuesday afternoon, and the reception said, two gentlemen to see you. And it was the chairman and CEO of Sunlum. Sunlum owned 54% of a company called Gencore. Gencore was a major mining industrial company, second only to Anglo-American. Sunlum's deputy chairman, Dr. Wim de Villiers, was appointed by Sunlum as its nominee on the board of Gencore. And he was chairman of Gencore, a Sunlum's nominee, was deputy chairman of Sunlum. One day, Dr. de Villiers comes to the chairman and CEO of Sunlum to say, there's just been a wonderful offer made to Gencore to sell an asset to Gencore that Gencore badly needs but the seller wants to be paid in Genco shares. And if Genco issued those shares, Sunlum would go below 50. So it would be very bad for Sunlum, very good for Genco. And Dr. De Villiers said, as a board member of Genco, I have to vote in favour of it at the Genco board. Sunlum went mad. They said, but you he are our nominee, and this is bad for us. So, they consulted me. I said, his duty as a director of Genco is to exercise an independent judgment. He cannot take instructions from his principal. If you don't like it, remove it. But that's his duty. So, in company law, a nominee on the board of a company has to act in the best interest of that company, do all of this and exercise an independent judgment. You cannot take instructions from your principal. Fundamental. So then 
people might ask, well then why do you, why appoint a nominee if they can't take instructions and look after your interests? Simple reason why you appoint a nominee on a board is because you want competent people on the board of that company in which you have shares, DPE and Eskim, whatever it is, but not to look after DPE's interests alone, to look after all stakeholders. You want and the principal will benefit if the uh, investee company is well run. That's why you want good people on the board. Not to look after your own interests, to look after the interests of all stakeholders. And this duty of an independent judgment is very fundamental. And then eight, to act within your powers. Now, we come to another set of duties. Separate from producing. The duties of care, skill and diligence. And what does the duties of care, skill and diligence mean? Is to run, manage the affairs of the company in a prudent way. Uh, not negligently. Taking proper decisions. Uh, managing it as a reasonable person of business would. So in the early days, the duty of care, skill and diligence, the director had to give only his or her to the company the benefits of his or her own skill, diligence and experience, subjective. So if you're appointed as financial director, Bachelor of Music, you knew nothing about Finance. The board would be wrong to do that, but that director only had to give the benefit of his own skill, knowledge and experience. The law developed and the test became objective. You have to manage the company as prudently and carefully as a reasonable person would do so. It's now developed further. The minimum standard is the reasonable person. But if any particular director has greater skill, diligence and experience than the reasonable person, they have to give that for the benefit of the company. And that's why in England and America, when directors are sued for mismanagement, they normally take the most experience because they are held to a higher standard. Now, where will all this arise? Let's take Steinhoff. Steinhoff, African Bank. Tongo. Forget about the fiduciary duties. Did they manage, did that board discharge their duties of care, skill and diligence? 
at the board of Steinoff, where frauds were occurring in the company. And what the courts have said, yes, it's not possible for in a complex company, the directors to know every detail of what's going on. But their duties are to ensure that there are controls and systems in place that would throw up red flags and then they must have the um, capacity to follow up the red flags. So, in order to discharge your duty of care, skill and diligence, you have to ensure that the company has control systems to detect um, breaches, internal audits, internal audit systems, and all the suggestions in codes of practice. Don't have executive chairs, have audit committees, have all of that. All of that is designed to ensure it's not a separate discipline, corporate governance, it's to assist the directors in discharging their duty. We've now got a new 76 form. It's called the business judgment test. Firstly, Care, skill, and diligence are all different concepts. Skill is your knowledge, experience. Care is how you apply it to the company. Diligence, how you prepare yourself, attend board meetings, read your board paper. Now we have got the business judgment test section. 76.4. There are only two countries in the world that have both the conventional negligence test that England and all the Commonwealth countries have, as opposed to America, which has the business judgment test. There are two countries in the world that have both, South Africa and Australia. And how do you reconcile it? If a director is sued for negligence under 76.3c, the traditional negligence test, breach of duty of care, skill and diligence, then if they can show three things, one, that they took all steps to be reasonably informed. Two, they had no um, conflict. And three, they acted rationally. That would be a defense. But that wouldn't be a defense if they breached their duty of honesty or acting in the best interest of the company. Quite a complex Let's now, this is what I call the substantive duty. Let's now talk procedure. 75 of the Act. South African company law here is strictest in the world on the procedure at meetings for dealing with conflict. 75.5 says, If you are a director or prescribed officer, prescribed officers um, defined in section 6610, read with regulation 38. If you are a director or prescribed officer and you come to a meeting and there's an issue before the meeting, not only a contract, any issue, including a contract, in which you have a personal financial interest, 
as defined in section one of the Act, or in which you know that any related person of yours has a financial interest, then five things happen. One, you must declare it. Two, you go to the meeting and you have to give your views on the matter. Three, you have to hear your colleagues question. Four, you then have to leave. South African company law, as opposed to others, doesn't allow someone with a conflict to stay on when the voting occurs. So 75-5, if a direct or prescribed officer has a financial interest or knows that a related party has, then five things disclose go to the meeting, answer questions, but give your views, answer questions. When they come to the final discussion and voting, get out. And that's to prevent anyone there sees uh, what, and people get intimidated, voting not allowed. Now let's talk about who is a related party. Section 2 of the Act says who's a related party, person in a marital relationship or relationship similar to a marital, or if you're related within the first two degrees of affinity or consanguinity, so your brother's a related party. Common ancestor, one degree, your mother, one, your brother, one to the mother, within two degrees. Grandparent, grandchildren, related parties. Section two of the Act. You control a company, it's um, a related party. Even if you don't control a company. So even if it's not a related party under section two, under 751B, if you are a director of A and a director of B, then if A is doing a deal with B, Mr. Smith, who is a director of A and B, sitting at A's board, B is a related party of his in the same way as his brother. So, getting back to 75.5. If a director or prescribed officer has a personal financial interest in the matter or knows that a related party has and knows is defined in section one as ought to know. So the law on procedure in 75 on avoiding conflict of interest is Rigid. And if it's breached, the transaction is not valid. It needs to go to sales. So there must be every two weeks of my practice, at least, I'm consulted. Oh, we passed a resolution. The chairman comes to me. One of the directors now comes. He forgot to declare an interest. So, this is rigid. Now, these are the fiduciary duties, the duties of care, skill and diligence, but there are many other duties. And let me just spend five minutes making one or two observations. Who is a director in South African law? How do you become a director? Four methods. You'll see why I'm pointing this out. One, if you are formally appointed, that's known as a de jure director. Two, even if you're not formally appointed, but you go to board meetings and participate as though you're a director, 
you are a de facto director and have all the duties of a director. And I always tell my banking clients, they've got a practice of sending someone as an invitee to board meetings. But I want them to or her to be have duties of director so they just go look after what's happening there. That person is a de facto director with all the duties of a director. Three, a shadow director. Shadow director is not de jure, not de facto, but sits in the shadows in the background and tells the directors what to do. And they listen. Then the person who gives the instruction is a shadow director. So be careful. Sometimes banks enter into loans with borrowers and there's a provision in the loan agreement. We can instruct you this, this and this. That bank would be a shadow director. Be careful your shareholders sometimes telling you what to do at board meetings and that. Maybe a shadow director. And then there's a puppet director who just takes instruction. So those are the four methods of becoming a director. What kind of directors do you have? A non-executive director. Clear. You're not involved in executive function. Two. An executive director. That's got two capacities. One as a director. Two. As an executive. Gives difficulties in labor law. Uh, in removals. Although it sounds simple, CEO, I'm an executive director, quite a difficult concept in law because you've got two capacities. Three, an independent director, and four, nominee director. Important takeaway all directors have the same duty. The standards of a non-executive director, of a direct executive, may be higher because they are more involved in the affairs of the company. They know more. But as a matter of law, famous relativism judgment, Howard versus Herigel, all directors have the same duty. One last statutory duty. South African law, as is the case with England or Commonwealth, had a doctrine called capital maintenance, where the capital of a company was the buffer, the cushion to protect creditors. In the new act, we abolished that. And now we've got the twin test of solvency and liquidity. A company can't do various transactions, distribution, dividend, financial assistance, unless it passes the solvency and liquidity test. The directors have a duty to apply the solvency and liquidity if they breach it, personal liability. Last one I want to mention, because fiduciary duties and duty of care, skill and diligence are effectively common law duties being codified, but they are statutory duties. Um, the um, solvency liquidity test. Also, not to trade in insolvent circumstances. Section 22.1 says, if a company is um, 
in circumstances which um, is likely to cause loss to creditors. Then the director would be personally liable under 77 3 